All right, as people are trickling in, I wanna welcome everyone to this webinar. Just so that you know, ca closed captions are provided during this webinar. It's very simple. All you have to do is click the CC at the bottom of your screen and the subtitles will show up for you. But just in case, I will also be putting that in the chat. If throughout this presentation you have any questions at all, please feel free to leave those in the chat. If you have any technical issues, please feel free to message me directly. My name is Kiana Leverett. I am the Community Outreach Coordinator for Georgia Audubon. And we are so, so, so excited to have all of you joining us. We'll get started in just a minute. All right, it is almost three minutes after. We're gonna go ahead and get started. I once again would like to welcome everyone to this webinar. My name is Kiana Leverett. I am the Community Outreach Coordinator for Georgia Audubon, and I could not be more excited to welcome Cam Maskelly. He is a self-taught paleontologist, and today he's going to be giving an awesome presentation about just what can be found here in the Peach State. So with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to you, Cam. Welcome, thank you for joining us. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm very excited to talk about some of the fossils that we can find in, in the state of Georgia. So let me share my screen here. All right, can everyone see that? All right, if everyone can see that, we can get started. So the paleontology in Georgia is very interesting. We have a lot going on here. We have over half a billion years of history going on in the state of Georgia. And so I'd like to start out with this um, quote here. Um, rocks are records of the environments, I'm sorry, rocks are records of events that take place at the time they were formed. There are books. They have a different vocabulary and a different alphabet, but you have to learn how to read them. So every time that we go out and we look on the side of the roads, you are looking at an ancient environment that occurred. Um, right here in Atlanta, Georgia, you can go throughout places in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and you'll see various different rock outcroppings. Um, the rocks that are on the rocks that are on the Atlanta, Georgia area are igneous rocks. So these are metamorphic, sometimes igneous rocks that occur. Some of these are actually the roots of uh, ancient volcanoes or ancient mountain building events that occurred over half a billion years ago. So we have a lot of the rocks that are going on, and those are actually the, um, the storytellers of what we're going to be talking about today, are the rocks and the fossils themselves. And so before we talk about fossils from the state of Georgia, we actually have to look on where we can find fossils. And so Georgia is broken down into at least three or four different geographical locations. So we have the coastal plain region, which is where the invertebrate fossils are. We find our um, youngest fossils in this section. So we find Cretaceous fossils all the way to some of the youngest fossils. And we actually have this line that cuts through or crosses the boundary between the coastal plains and the Piedmont region. This is known as the fall line. And the fall line is basically a separation within geology. And so the fall line separates the, the Piedmont section, which is where we find our oldest rocks, some of the igneous and metamorphic rocks, and it separates the younger sedimentary sediments um, and where we find our youngest fossils in, so the Cretaceous, all the way to the, our youngest uh, rocks and fossils. 
and then up to the Appalachian, uh, Appalachian Plateau and Valley of the Ridge region is where we find some of our oldest fossils. So fossils that date back to around 500 million years, all the way up to 200 million years old. So let's start to travel back in time. So hold on to your butts, everyone, because we are going to be traveling back in time half a billion years. It's going to be a while, but I promise you we'll get back to civilization very soon. So we start in the Cambrian period. The Cambrian period is about 542 to 498 million years ago. Georgia was a very different place back then. Um, it was covered under a shallow sea and it was south of the equator. We had tidal deposits and we had a lot of deposition of sedimentary rock that have occurred in Northwest Georgia, which is, a, which is where we find our sedimentary rocks that date back to this time period. And so during back in the Cambrian period, if you want to look for alien life, if you want to look at things that maybe look alien-like, there's Cambrian period is the perfect place to do it. It's the perfect place to go back to because a lot of the organisms that you see in the Cambrian, they don't exist today. They look very, very different from the organisms that live in modern in the modern oceans today. And so this is what the Cambrian of possibly Georgia would have looked like over 500 million years ago. And this death, and this is a representation of the Burgess shale fauna. In the Rocky Mountains, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So the first section that we get to is called the Shady Dolomite, and this is approximately 516 million years old. And the Shady Dolomite is actually the um, first rock deposit that we actually see that has fossils in them. And so the Archaeocyathid fossils are the oldest fossils in the state of Georgia. And so what are Archaeocyathids? Archaeocyathids are basically fossil sponges that have occurred. Their skeletons are composed of calcium carbonate. So they fossilize very, very easily in the fossil record. And so we do find archaeocyathid, these sponge, these sponge reefs in the rocks of Northwest Georgia. And they are composed of calcium carbonate. And these actually are the first reef builders in the fossil record. Um, corals and things of that nature don't exist. They um, come in a little bit later in the geologic time. But archaeocyathids we see are the first reef builders in Earth's history. And so here are a couple of archaeocyathid fossils from Bartow County, Georgia. And we can look at some archaeocyathid reefs in um, California and we can compare those together. And so that's actually what I'm working on right now, our research on some of these archaeocyathid fossils. Next formation is the Rome Formation. The Rome Formation is another Cambrian unit within um, Georgia. And we can actually see here, as I talked about before, rocks are um, echoes of their environment. In order for us to understand rocks, in order for us to understand life in the past, we have to be able to look at the rocks and interpret what the environment was like. And so this is a section of the Rome Formation. We see ripple marks and then mud cracks. Both of these correlate with each other because this means that this was a deposit that was um, exposed to the air. So we find these ripple marks. These ripple marks form through the um, movement of water, but we also have mud cracks as well. So these are probably um, tidal deposits that have occurred over 500 million years ago. So even 500 million years ago, these sedimentary structures still do exist. The next formation is the, the abundant rock unit that we actually do find the abundance of fossils in. And this is called the Conasaga Formation, which was deposited about 505 to 497 million years ago. We see a lot of things going on in this deep rock unit, and we find a wealth, treasure trove of fossils within this rock unit. And I have pictured on the Burgess Shale, um, we find salt preservation within the, Burgess, within the Conestoga Formation. That's very similar to the stuff that's in Burgess Shale. So we find some amazing fossils, including one of my favorite fossils called trilobites. Trilobites are um, creatures that look like crabs or insects. They were living on the ocean floor and they were looking for different detrital matter to search for. And these were organisms that were living in Northwest Georgia some 505 million years ago. And these are some of the trilobites that we actually do see. So as I talked about before, some of the very similar animals that we find in the Burgess Shale, we also find in Georgia. So we find hyaliths, which are relatives of brachiopods that kind of look like an ice cream cone. And then we have similar sponges like Choya here, but we also have a sponge known as Bruxella. It's not found in the Burgess Shale, it's very unique to the Conestoga Shale Formation. And actually the person who uh, named the Burgess Shale, Charles Doolittle Walcott, actually spent a lot of his time 
going through some of the rocks of Georgia and Alabama, describing some of the trilobites, including Bruxella, which he interpreted to be a fossil jellyfish, but now scientists determined that is probably a sponge fossil that occurred, um, a siliceous sponge, or siliceous meaning um, based on um, silica. These were silica-based sponges that, were, that occurred in the Conestoga Shale. So some of the very similar animals that have occurred in Conestoga Shale also occur in the Burgess Shale, and I find that's amazing. So right when we get into the late Cambrian to early Ordovician, we find stromatolite fossils. And stromatolites are basically the building up of algae over time. Um, these particular algae, these cyanobacteria, are full of, they are photosynthesizers. So they need, um, basically they need the sun to get their energy. And so these were also animals that secreted um, this limey type of substance on their bodies. And every time sediment would cover them, they would have to move up and up and up to feed on the, off of the sunlight. And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing a cross section of some of these um, late Cambrian to early Ordovician stromatolites. And so, as I said before, uh, ancient environments are echoes to the, um, are, are echoes to the, um, to what we see today. They are modern analogs. So stromatolites are still living today. And these are living stromatolites off the coast of um, Shark Bay, Australia. And we can look at those living stromatolites today we can compare what Georgia was like over five, over 497 million years ago during the late Cambrian to early Ordovician. Speaking about the Ordovician, that is our next time period that we're getting into. Um, it was under, uh, Georgia was under a shallow sea and there was a sea that covered most of uh, this particular state called the Iapetus Ocean. And um, it was laying, Georgia still laid south of the equator. And during this time, we find a large expanse of life. Um, we call this event, um, known as the um, Ordovician biodiversification bio event. And a lot of organisms started to bloom during this time. So we find a high abundance of brachiopods. We find um, some of the very first corals within the early Ordo Ordovician period as well. And these resulted in rock units known as the Chickamauga limestone and the Squatching Formation that is exposed on some of the highways and roadways um, off of Northwest Georgia. So this is what uh, Northwest Georgia probably looked like over the Ordovician. You have some of these cephalopods, known as ultracones. You had some of these plant-like animals. Um, they're not plants, uh, they're known as crinoids that would have been fixed to the bottom of the ocean floor. You have an abundance of crinoids and snails. And we find all of these creatures within the Ordovician rocks of Northwest Georgia. So the next, so the first section that we get into, the first Ordovician rock unit, is known as the Chickamauga limestone, named after Chickamauga, Georgia. And the Chickamauga limestone uh, was deposited on the late Ordovician. And again, Georgia was covered under a shallow sea. And this fan-like structure that you see here is actually an animal known as a bryozoan. These were rel relatives of brachiopods, and these lived in groups um, as well. So these are um, echoes of the Earth's past, um, of Georgia's past over 400 million years ago. We find abundance of trace fossils within some of the Ordovician rocks in Northwest Georgia. Um, on the left here, we actually see a slab of rock, uh, possibly sandstone or, lime, sandstone or limestone, that has trace fossils within them. And so by looking at these trace fossils, we know that some of these units were actually deposited in some of these shallow tidal deposits. And on the right here, we actually see a starfish resting place. So a starfish was moving, and it left its trace within some of the limey and muddy sediments off of this uh, tidal deposit in Northwest Georgia. During this time, we have a high abundance of volcanic activity. So a volcanic arch collided with North America, depositing volcanic ash. And this ash that, we, is, that is now clay is known as bentonite. And you can actually see these clays um, lodged in between some of these shales and limestones um, along some of the roads in Northwest Georgia, along Riggold. And so the next part that we get into is the Silurian period. And so this is a diorama um, at the Chicago Field Museum of what the Silurian period looked like over um, 420 million years ago. And here are actually some Silurian fossils that I've collected. Um, these are brachiopods. So brachiopods are basically some of these, what we call lamp shells. They aren't related to mollusks living today. They are their own thing. They are their own group. Um, they would have been attached to the um, bottom of bottom of the seafloor with a fleshy stalk, known as a pedicle. 
And we find a lot of these in abundance in some of the Paleozoic rocks, including the Silurian rocks. We find corals, we find horn corals um, living, uh, living on the bottom of the bottom of the seafloor. But we also find trilobites as well. This is one trilobite that was collected by Canty Smith, who was the former director of the TELUS Museum um, up in Cartersville, Georgia. And she found this particular um, brachiopod. I'm sorry, uh, this trilobite. And, so, and as you can see for the trilobite, it's actually enrolled. Um, this trilobite was probably protecting itself against dangers of the environment or anything that wanted to eat it. So trilobites will roll up into a tight ball, just like a roly poly would, to protect themselves against predators in the environment. The next part we get into is the Devonian period. And this is a time where we don't really have a lot of fossils from. Um, we find a lot of fossils in other places of the world, but unfortunately, Georgia really doesn't have that many fossils coming from the Devonian. This was a part in, uh, in our history where you had low oxygen. And so sediments like sandstones and shales were very, very poor in oxygen. We call this um, some of these units that are representing in Northwest Georgia, the Chattanooga Shale and the Armanchi Chert that were deposited in some of these um, poor oxygen um, oceans. So we do find some of the Chattanooga Shale um, in Northwest Georgia, but in other sections of the Chattanooga Shale, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is where the formation gets its name, we do find conodont fossils. We find conodont um, jaw elements. So conodonts are basically these eel-like animals, and we don't really see the conodont itself. We don't really see the whole animal, but what gets fossilized are their jaw elements, their teeth, and they're really good for index fossils. So you can use um, conodont teeth to be able to tell what the age of some of these rocks that you're in um, or how old these rocks were. And so you can use some of these eel, these teeth from these eel-like creatures called conodonts to tell what type of unit you're in and the age of that unit. And so we do find conodont fossils within the Chattanooga Shale in Tennessee, but I don't doubt we do find conodont fossils that are within the that are in the Chattanooga Shale in Northwest Georgia. Um, I haven't really heard that much research of any conodont fossils being found in the Chattanooga Shale, um, at least in Georgia. But if there's are, but if there's kind of not fossils within the Chattanooga shell. I don't, doubt, um, I don't doubt that there's probably kind of not fossils within that unit in Northwest Georgia. So next we get into the Carboniferous period. And this thing, this is where we get really interesting here. Um, the other periods are interesting, but the Carboniferous is one of my favorite time periods in their history. This is where we actually see another rise in sea level during, the, um, during Earth's history. And we have two different parts of the Carboniferous, um, at least in North America, it's broken down to the Mississippian, and then, which is known as the Lower Carboniferous, and then it's also known from the upper part of the Carboniferous, it's known as the Pennsylvania. The Lower Carboniferous is where we see a high abundance of sea level, and it's where we see a lot of marine fossils. And uh, the upper portion of the Carboniferous is where we start to see a lot of deltaic swamp environments. So we see a lot of plants living in that particular environment. And this is also where we see the largest supercontinent to have ever existed, Pangaea, uh, to take a symbol during the Carboniferous. And so the lowest portion of the Carboniferous, we see abundance of marine organisms, um, a lots of um, shales and limestones, and shirts actually start to be deposited in some of these ancient seas. And so here I am collecting with a um, couple people from uh, Northwest Georgia, um, from the geology department, uh, from, from the uh, geology department there, and I was collecting fossils from the lavender shell member. This is part of the Fort Payne, and we're actually finding sponge fossils, these delicate sponge that we actually, um, that we're actually looking at here. And so some of these sponge fossils are preserved in some of the rocks in the lower portion of the Carboniferous. Some of the other fossils that we find, we just talked about uh, brachiopods a little bit uh, earlier. Um, but brachiopods, uh, specifically the sporiferate brachiopods, or these winged brachiopods, do have a high abundance in the Mississippian period. So here I am with a brachiopod that has been replaced by quartz over time, um, found in the Fort Payne Formation in Northwest Georgia. Mississippian sharks. Who knew that there were these kinds of sharks living in, Mississippi, or living in the uh, Mississippian uh, oceans of Georgia? But I'm working on a research project right now with a shark paleontologist. And there was a shark tooth, one of, one of these teeth from what we call a stethicanthus that was actually found in the lavender shell member in the Fort Payne formation. A tooth, a very, very small tooth, about maybe a centimeter long. 
but we know that these sharks were living here um, about 340 million years ago. And so that's some of the research that I'm working on is describing some Carboniferous sharks or looking at some of their teeth and being able to write a paper on it. So I'm working on research on that, trying to describe the geology, and hopefully that paper should be published in the next couple of years or so. Now we get into the upper portion of the Carboniferous. And this is um, where we see a lot of plant life. This is where we see a, a high abundance of plants. And so the upper portion of the Carboniferous, we find a lot of plant fossils. Um, the Carboniferous period specifically gets its name from the amount of carbon that we see in these rocks. And there in the Pennsylvania is known from the rocks that have a high abundance of plant fossils in Pennsylvania. And we do have that high abundance of plant fossils in Northwest Georgia. And these are some of the various different types of plants that you can find. We find large scale trees known as Lepidodendron. Uh, we find fern fossils, and these all come from a formation known as the Crab Orchard Mountain Formation. Um, that's over 310 million years old from the lower, lowest portion of the Pennsylvania period. So sadly, we don't have any Permian, Triassic, or Jurassic fossils, though we do have off the coast of some of the, um, of some of the younger sediments, we do have, if we go down and we look at drill cores, we do have Triassic drill cores that are been able to be drilled down and pulled up that we do have um, off the coast of Georgia, but we don't have any Permian, Triassic, or Jurassic rocks on the surface. No sedimentary rocks on the surface that contain fossils from these particular time periods. So in the Permian, we do have Stone Mountain. Stone Mountain is a granite or a, a montanite granite. Um, it's actually formed by um, the uh, solidif solidification of magma underneath the earth. And the stone mountain that you actually see is that age, is Permian, but it doesn't have any fossils in it. So now we get into the Cretaceous. This is where we see the first sediments. And this is the uh, first coastal sediments or marine sediments from the coast. And this is the age of dinosaurs. And so we find the abundance of fossils within the Cretaceous period and it lasted from over 145 to 66 million years ago. And so various different formations are deposited within, north, within the southern region of Georgia. We find the Utah Formation, the Blocktown Formation, the Ripley Formation, and the Providence Sand, they all contain Cretaceous fossils. And yes, dinosaurs were living off the coast of Georgia um, some 70 to 80 million years ago um, when these sediments were deposited. And so a lot of the fossils that you do find of dinosaurs are found in coastal sediments, we don't find any terrestrial sediments with dinosaurs. Um, these dinosaur skeletons were basically carcasses that floated out the sea. Um, sharks and other organisms were scavenging on those dinosaur skeletons. And what, was, and what was left of those skeletons were basically dropped on the bottom of the seafloor and able to be fossilized. We also have giant um, alligator-like creatures known as dinosuchids living in that time as well, which is probably the dominant creature, the dominant top predator at that time. So this is what North, uh, this is what South Georgia probably would have looked like um, during the Cretaceous. You had um, lots of organisms. You had mosasaurs. You had turtles. You had fish. You had various different um, plethora of organisms living in these Cretaceous seas. And what we see now are just bluffs in South Georgia near the Chattahoochee River in Stewart County. So these, these are these are just some of the Cretaceous fossils that we see. Um, on the far left, we find an ammonite, which are mollusk fossils that are related to squids and octopi. Um, these were living in Northwest Georgia. Um, it's, really, uh, it's a really rare find to find ammonite fossils, especially this complete. Um, we also find uh, abundance of oysters known as exogyra and other types of oysters. And then we also do find, again, dinosaur remains. This is a uh, dinosaur tooth known as Apalachosaurus. And Apalachosaurus is a relative of Tyrannosaurus. Um, its first fossils were described, um, and I, I want to say in 2006, in the Demopolis Chalk, which is older than some of these sediments. The Demopolis Chalk is about um, 75 to 76 million years old. Some of these sediments are a little bit younger than that. But we do find Appalachiosaurus fossil remains um, in the Cretaceous sediments of Northwest Georgia. And here is a tooth. Um, all these, uh, the Exogyra and the Appalachiosaurus tooth, are on display at the Telescience Museum. And uh, the tooth was actually described, was actually found by my mentor, Bill Montante. Um, may he rest in peace. We also find other Cretaceous fossils. Here is a tooth on the uh, left side, far left, is a tooth from a Dinosuchus, um, one of these large alligator-like creatures. We also find an abundance of shark's teeth. 
Um, these teeth are known as scapanorhynchus. And then we also find large bones of plesiosaurus. So these were these long necked um, marine reptiles. So we do find a lot of those. Um, they're more rare than say uh, fish fossils or fish teeth, um, but we do sometimes do find teeth and bones from plesiosaurus and mosasaurus as well. So here we have the end of the age of the dinosaurs. Uh, the latest Cretaceous comes to an end. And we find the KBT boundary in Mississippi, but we don't find the extinction boundary between the extinction of the dinosaurs and the beginning of the Cenozoic era. We don't actually find that boundary. Now we do find Cretaceous sediments on top of some of the, or, or below the, so some of the younger sediments. So in Georgia, we find the Ripley formation and then we find the Clayton but we don't really have any of that evidence of an asteroid impact being flown all the way out here in Georgia. We just don't have that, but we do have, we can be able to tell, look at the rock strata and we can be able to look at what fossils are Cretaceous. And as we move up to the strata, we can be able to tell what fossils are Paleocene or Paleogene. So here is me and my friend Chase Egley at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary in North, um, in Starkville, Mississippi. And then over to the right is a clam fossil um, Bear Canaria uh, willexensis um, from the Clayton Formation. So we're just going to go through various different parts of time. Um, I don't specialize too much in the uh, Cenozoic specimens or the Cenozoic fossils and um, rocks. Um, there are definitely a lot more people out there more knowledgeable than I am to describe some of the fossils and geology around that area. But just to give you an overview of so what we have, we have an ancestral whale known as Georgicetus. Um, Volatensis that I really want to make the state fossil. Um, we have the state fossil now is the shark tooth. I think it's boring. Um, an ancestral whale from the state of Georgia is definitely a fossil that we should have as a state fossil. And during this time, during the Eocene period, Georgia was under again a shallow sea. We have a high deposition of these carbonates, and these are organisms that look kind of similar to what we see today. Um, they're a lot more uh, relevant. And they look very similar to some of the oysters and clams and um, echinoids that you may see today. So on the top here, we have a ancestral whale. Um, that's very important for understanding the evolution of cetaceans. And then on the bottom, um, we have a, uh, a, um, a sand dollar fossil known as periarchus. And as we get to the oligocene, we see an abundance of oligocene fossils, more echinoids, and other different types of fossils and clams. And so we get, as we get, start to get younger into this, um, younger into the geologic uh, time periods, we start to see things that look very similar to things today. So in the Miocene, we have giant megatooth sharks that were living off the coast of Georgia. Um, down in Savannah, you can find um, some of these sharks teeth, these megatooth sharks known as Carcaricles megalodon. And I'm pretty sure everybody knows the megalodon. It's a very, very famous shark. Um, in fact, there was a movie about it. Um, but here is I am at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science holding a megalodon tooth. I don't know if it comes from Georgia. Um, I'm pretty sure it probably comes from Florida, but we find the same teeth in, North, in, the, in the South Georgia region, around in Savannah and other places. If you go up to Northwest Georgia near Cartersville next to the Telus Museum, you may see a large outcrop of rock. Um, this is what we call the Lads Quarry, and we do find Pleistocene fossils within those um, ancient caves. Now you can't go caving anymore. The cave have, has been closed off, but during a uh, couple years, a uh, couple years later, I'm sorry, a couple years um, uh, back during, I want to say the 1950s, there were Pleistocene fossils that were being pulled out of here. Um, these are peccary fossils. We do find giant ground sloth and bats and all kinds of uh, interesting fossils, even jaguars. Um, jaguar fossils have been found from this particular uh, quarry. And as we're talking about ground sloth, here's a giant ground sloth that was actually found in the 1990s. That's on display at the Fernbank Museum of, of Natural History in Atlanta. So I really wanna thank all the various different people that helped me out um, uh, specifically with the images and information. Um, I could not have done it without them. Um, I'm continuing to learn about all these kinds of various different things and continuing to do more research in paleontology of Georgia and in the Appalachian region of this state. And so here are my sources. And if uh, anyone has any questions, I would be glad to take any. I would be glad to take some. 
All right, Cam, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. We do have a couple of questions. The first one is, why are only teeth of conodonts found? Good question. Yes. Yeah. So the teeth of conodonts are um, basically their hard parts. And so conodonts are invertebrate animals. Um, they don't have any hard parts to them. And so these are basically these ill-like creatures. And the only hard parts that they really have are their teeth. And so teeth are going to be a lot easier to fossilize than an animal that isn't made of bones. And so that's why we find, that's why conodont teeth are a lot easier to be found as fossils rather than the whole animal. It's just easier that way because of the mineral that they're composed of. Thanks for elaborating on that. The next question is, what was the purpose of that funnel fin on the top of the shark? Uh, the funnel fin? Hang on. Um, I'm actually don't know what I think could be, what I think could be it is probably um, display. So a lot of animals today will have large structures on their heads um, for display and that could have be been it, but I, I don't know. Um, that's a mystery to me. I'm still learning about these sharks and what some of their wacky structures on their bodies were used for. So I just don't know. Well, I hope that one day you're able to discover the answer through your travels and through what you find. The next question is, which plesiosaur do you think the vertebrae is from? Good question. It's, probably, it's most likely an elasmosaur. Um, the elasmosaur type plesiosaurs are the last type of plesiosaurs that go extinct in the Cretaceous. They're the last surviving plesiosaurs. Um, during the Cretaceous, or I'm sorry, during the Jurassic, we really don't see, we see a lot of the abundance of plesiosaurs. But during the transition between the uh, Jurassic to the Cretaceous, plesiosaurs start to go extinct. And so the elasmosaurs are basically the last plesiosaurs to survive the Cretaceous. And so we most likely, it's most likely from an elasmosaur. Thanks for that. Thanks for that question. Our next question is, what Mosasaur has been found in Georgia? Good question. So we do see an abundance of Mosasaur fossils. We see teeth, we see pieces of bones. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a complete skeleton. We just find isolated bones. Um, but based on the teeth and the bones themselves, we probably think it's probably a uh, Tylosaurus, which is a very large member of the uh, Mosasaur family that could get up to around 45 to 50 feet long. Um, we do find other types of um, Mosasaurs that look very similar to the ones in Alabama. We find a, a circular tooth type Mosasaur called Globidens. And it looks very similar to, um, looks very similar to that of Proganathodon, which has another similarity to Tylosaurus, but uh, instead of having these sharp pointy teeth, would have had these circular teeth for crushing clams. So that's one uh, Mosasaur that we find in Alabama that possibly does, that, it, that possibly is found in, um, in Georgia as well. But mainly, a lot of the pleases, a lot of the mosasaurs that we do find most likely belong to uh, Tylosaurus. Thanks. We have a couple more questions. The next question asks Are there books that have this information that you can recommend, particularly about the fossils? Uh, yes and no. There's a lot of information talking about the geology. Of the state of Georgia, one book that I would recommend or highly recommend would be The Roadside Geology of Georgia. Um, actually, I have it right here. Hang on. I have it right here, The Roadside Geology of Georgia. And this basically kind of just talks about some of the outcrops and some things about fossils that we can find in the state of Georgia. So I highly recommend this book. But specifically on fossils, um, no, we don't actually have a book. There is a book. In, you know, in the works on talking about fossils specifically from the state of Georgia. We have one on minerals, but it's just, it's in, it's in, the, um, it's in the works. But if you want to learn about the geology of Georgia, I would highly recommend this book and other places like museums, like the Tellers Museum and the Friend Bank Museum of Natural History. Thanks for that recommendation. I did share the name of that book in the chat. Can you tell us who it is by? Yes, it is by Pamela Gore and um, Bill Witherspoon. Pamela Gore and Bill Witherspoon. Thank oh, you. Gore. Pamela Gore and Bill yep. Witherspoon. 
Yes. Got it. Thank you so much for that recommendation. We do have another question. Are there any walks activity or activities for people to see in real life some outcroppings or guides that you recommend? Um, yes, so I do know that there is the Atlanta Science Festival. Um, I don't know if they've done it already, but every year they have the Atlanta Science Festival and they have these geology walks where you can walk with a real geologist, I'm a professional geologist, and you can basically go with him and look at some of the rock outcroppings in some state parks and things like that. So we do have those particular events. Um, you just have to keep an eye on the radar for them. If you can look up the Atlanta Science Festival, um, there are events like that that do happen. Yes, the Atlanta Science Festival is going on right now. So that is a great recommendation. Our last question for today is specifically about you, Cam. Folks would like to know how they can get in contact with you in order for you to speak to more people about what you know. Uh, great. Um, you can get in contact with me through social media. Um, I have a Twitter account. Um, it's at Paleo Cameron. Um, you can get in touch with me there. Um, I also have an email. Um, my email is paleo1364 at gmail.com. And you can get in co contact with me there as well. Um, I also have a YouTube channel um, known as Paleo 101. And I talk about various different subjects in geology and paleontology. So all those various different um, places you can get in contact with me there. Um, I use social media a lot. So you'll typically see me a lot uh, posting a lot of things about rocks and fossils. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that information. For everyone that is still currently with us, this has been recorded and will be available to everyone that has showed up and signed up for this webinar today. In addition to all of the information that was shared with us by Cameron for his email, for his social media, and his YouTube channel. So I encourage you to check those out and reach out to him if you're interested in having him speak to your group or if you'd like to know more. Cameron, thank you so much again for joining us today. It was a treat to learn about all of the information that you shared. And I can definitely say I learned a whole lot more about just what exactly is all around me. Well, thank you for having me. This was a great talk and I hope I'll be able to do it again in the future. Absolutely. With that being said, this is the end of this webinar. Thank you so much to everyone that joined us today, and we hope that you'll join us again soon. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.